I want to share a lesson with you that I've entitled Four Things We Should See When We Look at the Cross. We're going to talk about those things in just a couple of moments, but I want you to do something with me. I want you to allow your minds to go back to the time before the crucifixion of Jesus and think for a moment about what would be in the mind of an individual of that day when they saw a cross. I doubt very seriously if anyone was putting a cross on top of any buildings. And I doubt if anyone was wearing a cross as a piece of jewelry or if it was in any kind of artwork. No, when they saw a cross, there was nothing but bad thoughts that came to their minds. Crucifixion was an awful way to leave this earth. It was reserved for those who were enemies of Rome. It was so offensive that no Roman citizen, even if they were worthy of death, could be put to death by crucifixion. It didn't happen in Jerusalem, but in other parts of the world, crosses would be left up. People would be left up on those crosses. And there was a message. Anyone who comes to this part of the empire, if you get out of line, if you try to rebel, if you are disobedient to our laws, this is what's going to happen to you. And so when they saw a cross, their thoughts were very different. But Jesus changes all of that. And so today, when we look at the cross, what is it that we see? Well, I'm sure that there are some very powerful thoughts that come to our minds. I, I want to share four with you this morning for our sermon. The first one is this we should see the consequences of sin. My friends, when you look at the cross, I hope it reminds us of the consequences of our transgressions. If we're not careful, it is very easy for us to, to rationalize our sins and to begin to think of them as being not that big a deal. Oh, it just doesn't matter that much. In fact, quite often, maybe no one else even knows. It doesn't have an impact upon our world. It doesn't change things, we think. But I hope when we look at the cross, it keeps us from thinking those kinds of thoughts. And it reminds us of the consequences of sin. Because, folks, that was one of the purposes of the cross of Jesus. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, we're reminded, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But think for a moment about that, that first phrase. The wages of sin is death. Separation from God. That's what we're talking about. That's what sin brings about. And it doesn't have to be some catastrophic sin. It can be what man would call just a, a little sin. But the wage is still the same. It's death. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. It is a beautiful passage that speaks to us of the consequences of sin. There the writer says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. There's that penalty. The wages of sin is death. He is going to taste death for every one of us. Folks, when you look at the cross... I hope it reminds us of the consequences of sin, the sins of the whole world. But let's get personal. It reminds me of the consequences of my sin. Because I know Jesus didn't go to the cross because he sinned. 
He went to the cross because of my sins. To taste of death for every man, yes. But the taste of death for me. When I see the cross, I think about those consequences. This passage was read to us just a moment ago, but I hope you'll look at it again and notice all the times that the writer speaks of how our sins, our transgressions, our iniquities have been laid upon Christ. Again, the consequences of our sins. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. The world looked at him as if he's just getting what he deserves. That wasn't the case. He was suffering for us. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The consequences of sin. Jesus had to go to the cross. Look at verse 12 of that same passage. The last sentence or the last part. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And so, friend, when you look at the cross, here's what I want us to see. I want us to see the consequences of sin, the debt that had to be paid. Here's item number two. When we look at the cross, we should see the compassion of God. You think about how much God cares for us. It certainly goes beyond our understanding. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, a passage that perhaps is the most well-known in all the Bible and yet the most misunderstood perhaps as well. But you see that idea, for God so loved the world. He didn't just love the world, He so loved it. I remember when I was... Uh, a young dad, and I was teaching my children. I tried this with all of them, and it worked for a little while, but, but I would teach them, you know, how much do you love mommy? And, and I would teach a little bit, just a little bit. How much do you love daddy? Big much. Well, it was, they learned pretty quick where their bread was buttered, you know, and that, that turned around, you know, quite a bit. But how much does God love us? In the words of a child, big much, so much. God so loved the world. And when you look at the cross, you can just see how much that love is extended toward us. Romans 5 and verses 6 through 8. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure, for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ goes to the cross for us. God sends his only begotten to the cross for us, not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it or, or we're so worthy, we're so valuable, we're so precious. No. We didn't deserve it. And yet God still cares for us. Let me ask you, parents, grandparents, have you ever had that little child and they have gotten so dirty and so messy and then they run to you and they want to give you a hug? What's your response? Now, there'll be a few parents, a few grand... Go ahead and hug them anyway. But most of us will say, uh-uh, let's go take a bath. Let's go get cleaned up. Then I'll hug you all the... That's us, folks. Filthy with sin... And yet our God 
extends his compassion toward us. He cares so much. And when you look at the cross, I want you to not only see the consequences of sin, but I want you to see the compassion, the love of our God. 1 John 4 and verses 9 and 10. In this was manifest the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And so when you look at the cross, we should see the compassion of our God. Here's number three. When we look at the cross, we should see the commitment of Christ. Think about the choice that was made by our Lord, the second member of the Godhead. He's the one who humbles himself and leaves heaven, leaves behind his glory to become man, to die in our place. Think of the commitment that is shown. Paul writes about it in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The idea, he didn't hold on to that. He didn't think, it, think of it as something to be grasped, to be clinged to. He was willing to give that up to come to this earth made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross I'll tell you folks something I've been going to Costa Rica for about 23 years and every year after the first one the first one I was excited to go I didn't know what to expect it was a whole new world for me, and, and I, I, I was excited about going. After that, I have not been nearly as excited because I know what's waiting. Now, I love going and working. I love the people. I love meeting with folks and preaching and teaching. I, I, I enjoy those things. But you get there, and it's hot. I, I mean, it's, it, it's hot, hot, humid, hot. And the bugs, I, I don't know, I'm old negative blood type, they must thrive on it. And, and I think there's a memo sent out as soon as I land, he's here. You know, and the mosquitoes or whatever, they're, they're just laying. I have a, my, my dad's my roommate most of the time. I wake up with 12 bugs. They didn't bother me. They didn't bother him at all. I don't understand. I haven't put him by the window. It still doesn't work. And then... You know, you got, well, it's hit or miss with the showers, right? We got showers, I'm thankful for that, but you don't know if it's going to be hot or not. And all ah, those cold showers, you just have to count, like one, two, three, and jump in, and, you know, soap, and then and get out. I mean, it, it's, it's hard. The food, I hope you like rice and chicken. And I do, I, and... and I can, eat, I can stand on my head and eat peanut butter for a week. I, I get to come home at the end of the week. But, and and I, I feel ashamed almost telling you that because I, I shouldn't feel that way, I don't think. I, I ought to be excited about going and that kind of thing. But it, there's hard things about Imagine our Lord leaving heaven to come here. To a, a land of sorrow and sin and suffering and death and knowing all the time what was going to happen, how this is going to end. I've ruined Hallmark for my wife. She used to love to watch it, but every show is boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl back. E every show. And, and so, you know, I, I've kind of ruined that. What if you know the ending already? 
And it's not good. It's not pleasant. Jesus knew. But he comes anyway. When you look at the cross, I want you to think about his commitment. Notice this. Matthew 20, verse 17 beginning. And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, and to scourge, and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. Did Jesus know what was going to happen? Absolutely. Folks, every step he took upon this earth was a step closer to the cross. And he took it anyway. When you look at the cross... I want you to think about his commitment. Do you remember what they said as they passed by? Some of them said, if you're the son of God, come down from that cross and we will believe. He could have done it just like that. But he stayed there because of his commitment to doing the will of God to bring about our salvation. Here's the last thing I'll share with you this morning. When we look at the cross, we should see the opportunity that we have to be converted. Yes, we see these other things that we've talked about this, this morning. We, we've talked about the, the, the consequences of sin and, and the compassion of our God and the commitment of our Lord. But why? Why are those things significant? What, what's all that leading to? It's leading to this, folks. The opportunity for us to be com converted unto Christ. The opportunity for our souls to be saved. Romans 6 and verse 17. Paul is able to write, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. What a transformation has taken place in the hearts of these men and women. It's been brought about because of the cross of Christ. It's all because of Him. Because of what He did in going to the cross and then rising from the grave. That's why we can have the forgiveness of our sins. That's why we can have the hope of eternal life. And when I think of the cross of Christ... I'm reminded of the opportunity that's been given unto me, given unto you, for us to be converted, for us to come to Christ, to come to the cross, to die unto self, to be baptized into His death, and to be raised to walk in newness of life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 9 through 11, you read about that transformation, that conversion that has taken place for these Corinthian Christians. Paul writes and says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Folks, that, that's amazing. This is what they used to be, but they're not anymore. Why? Because they've obeyed the gospel. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. They had been converted unto Christ. And that is possible because of the cross. I'm sure there are a lot of other things that we could talk about this morning that would, that would be fitting for us to consider 
as we look at the cross. But I want you to think about these four. When you look at the cross, I want you to see, I want you to see the consequences of sin. I hope that as we think about that, it reminds us this is why my Savior had to die. And it'll cause us to stay away from sin with all that's in us. I hope that we see the compassion and the love of our God that allowed him to send his son to die in our place. I hope we see the commitment of Christ in leaving heaven to go to a cross. And I hope we'll see the opportunity that we have for conversion. I hope you see that this morning. I want to close by sharing this story with you. There was a little boy in a little village. He was about six years old, and he'd gotten separated from his group, and, and he was lost in that village. He didn't know his street address. He didn't know where, how to tell anybody to help him to get back home. His people would stop, and where do you live? I, I live in a white house. Well, well, that doesn't help us much. What's the, I don't know. And finally, he remembered there was a building in the town that had a cross on the front of it. And everybody in town knew about that cross. And he, and, and, and he knew how to get back to his place from that building. And so he told those people that were there, that were, that were trying to help him. He said, if you can get me to the cross, I can make it home. Well, folks, that's where we've tried to, to bring one another this morning. To the cross. And if you get to the cross, folks, you can make it home. Because it's in the cross that we have hope. And today, if you've not yet come to that cross, not yet come to Christ in obedience... We want to encourage you to take that step. This day you can put on Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins and begin living that faithful life of service that will lead you home. And if you're here as one who has obeyed but you've fallen away and you need to come back, we want to pray with you and for you. Get me to the cross and I can make it home. Do you need to come to the cross of Christ? If you do, come now as we stand and as we sing.